Just when you think the Seattle Mariners have righted the ship, the old mistakes crop up again. And one more time, Luis Castillo is going to be on the bump for a very important start. We'll get to all of that. It's Mariners Madness. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast. Mariners Madness with Rob Guerrera. The pitch from Acevedo. A drag feet to right field. Down the line. The Mariners win this game 2-1. to one. The dream lives. They're going to the playoffs. The drought is over. The sickest Seattle Mariners podcast. It's going to be sick. What is good, everybody? Welcome to Mariners Madness on the Sick Podcast Network. I am Rob Stats Guerrera here with you. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Rate, review, and follow us. Leave a five-star rating and a review wherever you get your audio podcasts. Oh, boy. We got a big show for you today. We're going to talk about a bad start in Texas for Bryce Miller again. We'll talk about the rest of the series finishing up today. And of course, we'll do three up, three down, which we always do on Thursdays. Let's start with last night. Bryce Miller in his career has not been good against the Rangers. And unfortunately, that continued last night. He wasn't good again. Four innings, four hits, two runs. Could have been way worse. Also had four walks. And he threw 83 pitches in those four innings. He just, he can't beat the Rangers in his career. He is now at, I believe it's 12 innings pitched against the 12. Oh no, I'm sorry. Excuse me. 12, six, six ERA against the Rangers. 10.2 innings pitched 18 hits in those 10.2 innings, 15 earned runs. When you have more earned runs allowed than innings pitch, you know, a team is handing you your medicine. And that is the case with Bryce Miller. His whip is (laughs) 2.3. That's terrible. And look, maybe it's just, you know, they say styles make fights. Maybe it's just a case of the Rangers hitters can can track and hit Bryce Miller stuff. But it was ugly last night in Texas. And it could have been worse. Not only were there a bunch of hard hit balls that were caught, but even some of the ones that weren't caught. Texas had a guy that was going to walk to third base for an easy triple. He falls down going over second base and gets tagged out trying to get back to the bag. So it was just ugly for Bryce Miller. Now, to be fair, Bryce has been awesome against pretty much everybody all year long. He had a one eight five ERA in his first four starts of the season. So he's been great. But Texas is a bugaboo for him. It's just, for whatever reason, he struggled. And look, you got to fix that, right? This is a World Series champion. It's going to be a playoff team in the American League. They're tied for the division lead right now because of this loss. So you, you got to figure it out, man. Hit the film room, do whatever. But it's got to stop. It was not good. For Bryce Miller. And honestly, it wasn't good for the whole Mariners yesterday. It was the same old mistakes, right? Suspect starting pitching, just like we saw in the first 12 games of the year. Putrid situational hitting. And defense suspect, again, at multiple spots. Just totally self-inflicted wounds by Seattle. And that's how you lose 5-1. to one. And it started right away. It started right away. First inning. Josh Rojas leads off the game with a triple, just absolutely blasted it, which by the way, Rangers ballpark is phenomenal. Like you can actually hit a ball and have it not go over the fence and let people run and have a little excitement. So that was kind of cool. There were a bunch of those last night. Rojas triples Julio strikes out. Why? Because they threw him a slider down and away like he always strikes out. I mean, it's frustrating with Julio that he seems to keep making the same mistake over and over again. Doesn't realize where the ball is going to be thrown to him. Polanco walks great. First and third, one out. Perfect situation. First inning, chance to get up on the Rangers early. Let Bryce Miller exhale a little bit, right? Give him some breathing room in a, in a, against the team and in a place where he has struggled in his career. And what happens? Mitch Hanniger gets up. Now, to his credit, he at least put the ball in play, which can't say that for every Mariners player. He hits a slow roller to the right side. I actually thought the Rangers could have gone home if they wanted to. I think there was time. I was really surprised in the moment that they threw to second. They get the force at second, a run scores, and that's the only run the Mariners would score the entire game on that slow little dinky roller by Mitch Hanniger. 
Even after that, Ty France gets up single. Great. Okay, here we go. And Rayleigh strikes out. And the Mariners get the one run, and that's it. You you got to take advantage of these opportunities when you have them, and they just consistently don't. You know, up until a couple of days ago, the Mariners had the least productive outs in all of baseball. I saw that. I think that was in the athletics power rankings. Of all the teams in Major League Baseball, nobody had less productive outs than the Mariners. And I, I did learn in that same article, by the way, that Runner on third with less than two outs, teams fail 70% of the time to get the run in. Like, that's just like Nash, uh, universally around the league, which really surprised me. Like, maybe I was like, okay, I need to be less harsh on the Mariners. But then I read that they <laughs> still had the least amount of productive outs in the league and got mad at them all over again. But that was just like such an, an indicative example of what the Mariners were going to do last night. They just, it was the same old bad old Mariners. And you saw it again in the fifth inning. Same situation. First and third. One out. You really need to score, right? Because Texas has hit a couple of home runs off Bryce Miller. You need to answer. And first and third, Hanniger strikes out. And France, I believe, grounds into a, a 4-3 put out. End of threat. At least when you're in these situations, you got to be able to make productive outs. Hit a damn fly ball to the outfield. Put the ball in play. Maybe they make an error, whatever. But time after time after time this season, and really the past couple seasons with the Mariners, situational hitting has just eluded them. And it is so maddening to watch because they have the talent and the skill to get there. They just can't finish the job. And it's like, man, at least if you're going to be, if you're not going to score, don't get my hopes up all the time, right? Sometimes it feels like that. I know that's not the case, but man. And it was just time after time, they let you down. There are guys producing in the lineup, but it's not consistent. It's not the guys you want producing. And it really puts the onus on the pitching. That's the part that scares you is you're making these guys walk such a fine line every single day. If the other team scores two runs, that shouldn't be insurmountable. And too many times this season, not all the time. I know they've been better recently, but too many times this season, it has been for the Mariners. It's just a sloppy all-around performance. You had bungling in the field defensively, which we'll get into a little bit more later. You, you had Dylan Moore striking out because of a pitch clock violation because he wasn't ready in time. Like, what are we doing? Like, wake up, right? Come on. Chances are the Mariners are going to strike out anyway, but at least have to see a pitch to strike out on for God's sakes. So that was just very disheartening because it's a, it's an important series for the Mariners. And I'll talk about that a little more too, but I, you know, I don't fall into this. Well, it's April 25th. No, these, this counts, man. It's important. And so when your team has a showing like that in a big game against a, you know, division rival against the world series champions, it hurts. I wanted to, to see where this team stacks up against a, World Series champion, right? It's one thing to beat the Rockies. Okay, fine. The Reds, that's great. But this is your litmus test. And now the Mariners could still win the series. Let's, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that, right? And winning two out of three in Texas against the Rangers and, and to be in first place would be great. And I'm not going to complain about that. That's why today's game is big. Whole different feeling if you can win today's game. And once again, Who's on the mound for the Mariners? It's amazing how often this comes up. Here comes Luis Castillo again. Perfect opportunity for you. You want to be the ace, Luis Castillo? Fine. Be the ace. Show me. Let's see it today. Last time you pitched, you were brilliant. Brilliant. But you faced the Rockies, okay? <laughs> this ain't the Rockies. Let's just say that. You get paid to perform against teams like Texas. Good for you against Colorado. They're a bad team and you dominated them and that's what you should do. And that's to your credit. I'm not taking anything away from that. That counts too. This counts a little more. This is different. Big situation for your team, right? Series tied at one. Team is shorthanded, which we'll talk about in a little bit. You're on the road. You're playing for first place. You just had a bad game. Be the stopper. Be the ace. Let's see it. Shut down the Rangers. Don't give up four runs in four innings like you have way too many times this season. Lock it 
down. Keep the ball in the damn ballpark and lock it down and show me that you're going to be the ace. Because you know, if you've listened to the show at all this year, judging by some of the YouTube numbers, maybe you haven't. But I'm convinced that Luis Castillo is not the ace of this staff. Convinced. Has to be George Kirby, in my opinion. Or Logan Gilbert's making a pretty damn impressive push, too, who was phenomenal in game one against Texas. But I don't think it's Castillo. And I really hope on Tuesday, when I do the next episode of this show, we're talking about how great he was. I really do. I'm not holding my breath, but I would like to see it. Because here's the thing, it doesn't get any easier. You finish off this series against Texas, then you're playing the other World Series team in the Diamondbacks for three. You got Atlanta for three, and you got Houston for three. And I know Houston has been bad this year, but they still have a lot of talent. For the most part, this sort of core for Houston has owned the Mariners. I know they didn't last year, but for the most part, they have. I'm not taking Houston lightly at all, at all. So it's not, it's a tough road to hoe. You know, this team has 52 games in their next 55 days. That is rough. You're going to need your starting pitching to contribute. You know, you're going to need them to go long into games so you don't burn out your bullpen. And it is going to be a grind here. So you can't be dropping these games. You got an, a chance to win this series. Go do it. And it starts with Luis Castillo. And I hope he's figured it out. That's what I'll say. You know, he struggled in multiple starts earlier in the year. Last time out against the Rockies, fantastic. I think he threw seven shutout innings, had nine strikeouts. Great. Looked like the guy that so many people thought he was going to be. That looked like the guy who pitched in the playoffs against Toronto, who was just unbelievable. Lights out. Maybe maybe it was a, the first couple starts this year were a fluke. I don't know. I hope they were. Hopefully he's figured it out. You know, I, I talked with Jason Stark of The Athletic earlier this week on Tuesday, and he talked about Julio Rodriguez struggles, and he said baseball is weird. Sometimes guys just struggle for whatever reason, and maybe maybe Luis Castillo went through the same thing. I, I hope so. I'm not confident, but this would go a long way to changing my mind. I, I'm, you know, if you listen long enough, you'll realize I'm not opposed to changing my mind. I'm I never promise 100% accuracy on the show. I always promise hundred percent authenticity. I give you my honest feelings about Luis Castillo based on what I've observed and what has happened on the field. But if he puts out a bunch of good starts, I will admit that I was wrong. That's fine. I would, I would love to be wrong. God knows I'm going to be wrong on a bunch of stuff anyway. At least if I'm going to be wrong on this, it means good things for the Mariners. Let's see it tonight. Luis Castillo. It's going to be hard to keep an eye on it because tonight's the NFL draft, which I understand, but don't worry. We'll, we'll have an eye on everything. <sighs> All right. Let's get to it. Three up, three down. <laughs> All right. Let's start with the positive. I always like the positive. And to be honest, there were a lot of choices this week for three up, three down, because things have been going pretty well for the Mariners lately. I'm going to give a little love, first of all, to Julio Rodriguez, who has been on fire at the plate and in the field. Over his last eight games, he's hitting 400. He has four stolen bases. His average has gone from 190 to 266 just in the last eight games. He has 14 hits. Five of those eight games are multi-hit games. He had his first home run of the year, which was an absolute moonshot. It was one of those where the outfielder doesn't even move. They just sit there and look up and watch it go a million miles out of the park. And his defense has been right there with it. He's always been a good defensive outfielder, but man, he is ramping it up. The range, catching ability, making diving catches, making heads up strong throws to get runners on the bases. He has been doing it all. And, you know, he wasn't originally a center fielder. Remember that. Originally, he was going to be a corner outfielder. And then he went to the team and was like, I think I can play center field. And he's not just playing center field. He's playing it at a gold glove level. That's incredible. And he's doing all the stuff at the plate that he's doing. The combination of those two things, there were a lot of, there was a lot of competition for this spot and three up, three down for the number one spot. I'm giving it to Julio. Just the combination of both sides of the ball, as they say, it's been fantastic. I hope the homers continue to come. I hope he can keep it up. But man, he has been on a tear. And you, you hope that this would be the case, right? Because we're getting to the end of April. And historically, March and April have been Julio's worst months. So maybe this is the start of him kind of coming out of that a little bit. I hope so. But uh, love to see it from Julio. Let's keep it going. 
Next up on three up, three down. And this is a name I did not think I would be saying here very often. It's Josh Rojas. Josh Rojas has been getting it done for the Mariners and not just getting it done. He leads the team in batting average. He leads the team in on base percentage. And he's second on the team in slugging percentage through basically a month of the year. He's been bringing it. Again, last eight games, eight hits for him. Half of those eight hits have gone for extra bases. I mentioned the leadoff triple he had last night. He's got an 891 OPS in that time frame. And much like Julio, he's been playing great defense at third base too. He's making diving plays. He's making great stops on 100 mile an hour batted balls and starting double plays. He has been much better in the field than I thought he was going to be in spring. Like when I watched him in spring training, he it was scary at times. He's been much better recently, much, much better. Love that. And uh, it's going to be his spot at third base because Arias is hurt. So he's kind of got an opportunity here and he's been taking advantage of it in a big, big way. Hits in seven of his last eight games. Keep it up, Josh. You know, this was somebody that they had high hopes for when they brought him in, and he's been living up to that a little bit. So you absolutely love to see that. Josh Rojas, number two in three up, three down. Number three, Cal Raleigh. What is not to love about Cal Raleigh? He's He's got a great personality. He held the team to account publicly after last year. He's got a phenomenal nickname, Big Dumper, and he is murdering the ball right now. The only thing that stopped him was a bad tooth, which we'll get to in a second. Over his last eight games, four homers. His OPS is over 1.3. He is mashing right now. His on-base percentage is 486. He's basically 50-50 to get on base when he comes up right now. If it wasn't for that damn bad tooth, he probably would have had two more hits last night. He had a broken tooth. He played an entire game with a broken tooth, he had to have emergency dental surgery, and he was still trying to get in the game last night, which is unbelievable. Uh, he may play tonight. He's he's a uh, game time decision, so we'll see with Cal. You just you love him, man. Eleven hits over the last eight games, nine RBI, six walks. Again, I said it. You know, other than Adley Rushman, nobody's going to depend on their catcher for offense more than the Seattle Mariners in the American League, and Cal has been coming through in a massive way. Everything he does, you love this guy. There are guys on the Mariners right now that are absolutely beloved by this fan base. Julio, for one, of course, good, young, charming, charismatic, all that stuff. Plus, he re-signed. He signed the big deal, so he's not going anywhere for a while. So that just, the combination of all of that, like, yes, Mariner fans will love you forever. He's definitely up there. J.P. Crawford, I think, is up there right now, although I don't think it's at the level of Julio. I think the guy that's at the level of Julio is Cal Raleigh. He is beloved by Mariners fans. Beloved. All of it. The big dumper. I don't know if it's catchers. Like Mariners fans also love Dan Wilson, which I didn't really understand because he wasn't really that good of a player. But maybe it's just a catcher thing in Seattle. I have no idea. But Cal Raleigh, man, beloved by this fan base. And it's easy to see why. Oh, also, he hit the walk-off home run that ended the streak. That may be part of it, too. Or ended the drought, I should say. That may be part of the love for Cal. But he's earning every single bit of it right now. And hopefully that tooth, I don't know, numb it up, put some gauze in it, whatever you got. I don't even know. What do they do for a broken tooth? Do they fix it? Or do they take it out? Or do they, like, glue it together? I have no idea. Broken tooth? How do you even break a tooth? Maybe you got hit in the face with a ball or something. I don't know. All right. Those are the three good. Julio Rodriguez, Josh Rojas, Cal Raleigh. Now, unfortunately, we got to get to three down. And I don't like to do this, but J.P. Crawford. You're first up on three down, literally down. Scary injury for me. That's the oblique. Oblique injuries are just one of those. They're like a lat injury. It's just one of those things that can be very serious. It can linger for a really long time. And you really, you can't like play through it. It's not one of those injuries where you can come back when you're like 80% because then it flares up again and you're down again for even longer. You really have to kind of sit and wait and let it play out. Let it get fully, fully healthy before you come back. I know he was going to have an MRI, so they don't know the severity of it. Hopefully, it's a very, very minor thing, but you got to be really careful. Like I said, you have to, even if it's minor, you have to let it heal up. If you're going to try and play through it, it's not going to work. It's going to impact your play on the field, and it's going to flare up, and then you're going to be really out for a long time. And I, it's a shame because he had been heating up 
recently. He's hitting 198 on the year, but he had seven hits in his last five games. So he had been kind of starting to turn the corner, and this may just take all the momentum away from him. And there was a period of time where I felt like this with every Mariners prospect where they would come up, they would start to put it together, and then they'd have some sort of fluke injury, and they would like never regain that form that they had pre-injury. JP had a really good year last year. We were really hoping that he had turned a corner and that he was going to build on this. And he came out of the gate so slow this year, and it was so disheartening. And he just started to maybe get back to the 2023 form. And now we got to sit and wait, and we don't know. And this is not a position of depth for the Mariners. I mean, the backup infielder, Dylan Moore, who yee, we saw Dylan Moore yesterday. I'll get into that in a second. But they really need JP. He's one of the team leaders. He's great defensively. They don't have a lot of great individual defenders. He's one of them, obviously at a premium defensive position like shortstop. So heal up JP, but unfortunately you find yourself on three down today. Next up, the defense as a whole. I mean, it has been for the most part bad this year. And we saw it again. Mitch Hanniger fields a, a base hit, ground ball base hit last night. Goes to take the ball out of his glove. Whoop! Flies behind him. Dylan Moore. Ground ball double play potentially at shortstop. Nope. Can't do that. Botches it. Leads to Moore. We had a freaking guy in the baseline, a pitcher in the baseline, just standing there blocking the runner. Nope. Guess what? That's obstruction. That eventually ends up leading to more runs. Some of these just totally unfortunate forced errors. It's almost like a concentration, like a focus error. I don't know what the hell is going on. We always hear about Perry Hill and how good Perry Hill is with the infielders. Well, where is it, man? Where is it? Because that infield for the most part has been bad. B-A-D bad. Now I know Josh Rawls has played better lately and he has. So maybe you can give Perry Hill a little credit there, but, but Polanco has been bad. Dylan Moore has been bad. Ty France is average at best at first base. Now you got Mitch Hanniger can't even take the ball out of his damn glove. He had a ball bounce off Julio's leg last night. It matters, man. Again, we talked about putting your pitchers in a bind. You, you make their margin for error so small already with your offense being as bad as it is. Now, if you're not going to play defense, if they can't even trust the defense behind them to make the routine plays, it's one thing to not be able to make superstar plays all the time. Okay, but you got to be able to make the routine ones. And they were just sloppy, sloppy, sloppy yesterday. I don't know that it's going to change. That's the scary part. I, I think I could probably put them in three down like every week. And I hope that's not the case. But, you know, we're a month into the season right now. It's not early. Don't give me early anymore. Like, we're here. These This counts. So... Defense number two on three down. And then the third one on for three down. I just saw this before we recorded. The Kraken are leaving Root Sports. They're going to go to Amazon Prime and, and show their games on over-the-air TV. Uh, King 5, I believe it is. And, and I don't know. You probably know this already. But if you don't, the Mariners own Root Sports. They own a majority stake in Root Sports. And... They were hoping, you know, to make some money off the Kraken ratings, and now the Kraken are leaving. And it could be good because that probably means the Mariners don't have to pay them the rest of the money on a contract. It was three. Uh, this is year three, I believe, of a five-year contract. But if you're the Mariners and you're trying to get people to pay that extra money in the cable package for Root Sports, now the Kraken are gone locally in Seattle. It's like, it's just, it's all on the Mariners. It is all on the Mariners. You can't be 500. If people are going to have to fork over extra money to watch you now, you're going to have to be damn good. You're going to have to make it worth their while. And just, again, the fact that in 2013, the Mariners decided, let's go all in on a local TV network and buy it up, right? You, you're not skating to where the puck is going. And that's what put them in this situation. That's why they're here now is because they were like, yeah, we're going local TV. And then everybody started cutting the cord and they're like, oh, we never could have seen this coming. You should have seen it coming. So it's just a bad look for the Mariners. It looks like a sinking ship from a from a business perspective. And that, <laughs> for all the criticisms of the Mariners as a baseball team, from a business perspective, the Mariners were very well run. They always made money. They were number one in revenue, I think, two years ago. Like, they usually know what they're doing from the business perspective, but they have biffed this thing totally. And I don't know what they're going to do a year from now. I think they've said... This year, it's going to be Root Sports, and that's what they're going to do. 
a year from now, who knows? But as long as they have so much money tied up in Root Sports, the purse strings are not going to open for the Mariners ownership group. And that's obviously bad for all of us. So three down, J.P. Crawford, team defense, and the Mariners as an organization, or at least from the business side, with the crack and leaving. So game three tonight against Texas, as I mentioned, three against Arizona, three against Atlanta, and then three against Houston. It's going to be very, very telling as the Mariners embark on this 52-game stretch in the next 55 days. They are in first place right now. They haven't been in first place this early in a season, I think since the early 2000s. I want to say 2004 or 2009, around there. Um, so it's they've righted the ship a little bit, but if they're not careful, they can sink right back down. they got to handle their business. I want Luis Castillo to prove me wrong tonight. I hope he does. I will be pulling for it to happen. Just don't expect it to happen. But regardless of what happens, we will be back. We're here every Tuesday and Thursday for you here on the Mariners uh, Madness podcast. I am on all the socials at Stats on Fire. Hit me up. I love to talk baseball. The DMs are open. Feel free. And again, leave us a five-star rating and a review wherever you get your audio podcasts. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, everybody. We'll talk next week. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast Mariner's Madness with Rob Guerrera on YouTube, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.